This morning we're going to be looking at the book of Psalms this morning as we go to our scripture reading. So if you would stand with me, please. Uh, We'll look into the Word of God. And the uh, passage I'll be reading is Psalm chapter 1, and that's page 843 in your pew Bibles if you choose to follow along. Psalm number 1, Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, and yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers, not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, as we come to you now this morning, I just pray that the meditation of my heart and the words of my mouth would be pleasing and satisfying to you and be an encouragement to us as we go forth from this place. And I pray this in your name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. This morning we continue our series that uh, I'm calling Grounded, which is... uh, hopefully going to be a time over the next few weeks when we really look at what the church is about. And one of the things I reminded us of last week was that the church uh, is grounded, first of all, in Scripture. And we need to make Scripture the whole basis of everything we do. And a lot of times what's happened, as we've talked about in previous weeks, is that uh, we as human beings tend to add things to Scripture unintentionally to try to help us grow closer to God, and pretty soon those things become more important than Scripture itself. But, but the Bible needs to be the basis of, of everything that we do. The second thing that we need to do is we need to realize, and this morning we'll be talking about it, is that the church should be a shield. Uh, you know, a shield does two things. First of all, it protects, and the second thing it does is it helps you to advance. Uh, I remember when I was uh, a junior high youth sponsor, and one of the things that I did that was probably the smartest thing in all my years as being a junior high youth sponsor is that we had a, a family in our church that had a, a cabin at a lake that was a couple of hours away. And one day I was talking with a dad and he said, you know, if you ever want to bring your kids up to the cabin for a weekend or whatever, just you know, go ahead and bring them up. And I got thinking about it and I thought, well, that would be a pretty good idea to have a youth retreat with junior high kids on a cabin in the middle of the woods. It seemed like such a good idea at first. I even had the presence of mind to make sure that I had another couple going up with me so that it wasn't just me against 30 kids. It was. It was probably the best thing that I ever did because what I found out that it did is it built unity in that group that I'd never seen in the previous years. Uh, But unity doesn't come easily. If you've ever been um, in a car, well, think about it. Think about when you're traveling somewhere, uh, if you're traveling like with your family or whatever. How many of you have ever heard, especially if you're in a big family like mine, something to this effect of, if you two don't knock it off back there, I'm pulling the car over right now. You ever remember hearing that? I found out what happens when the car gets pulled over right now, because I grew up in the day when Dad would take his belt off and show me what would happen if I didn't sit quietly. I grew up okay that way. Unity doesn't come without a certain amount of pain. And I found this out with junior high kids because, you know, when you come to junior high, for example, or anywhere, not just junior high, I'm not just picking on that age group because it's any of us, um, when you come and get together on Sunday morning, you know, you come here for an hour of church, even if you don't like people, you can get along generally pretty well, right? Um, but when you're put in a situation where you're trapped with each other for 24-7, amazing things start to happen. Masks start to come off. People start to see the way you really are. Not only that, but those people that you used to think were your friends can tend to annoy the snot out of you. Am I right? And then throw into the fact that you're a junior high kid, so you've got all kinds of other stuff going on. 
the first couple of hours of the retreat, which most of those were spent in the car, were pretty tough because all of a sudden people started to uh, annoy each other. And we had to not only spend time in God's Word, seeing what God's Word had to say, but we also had to realize and, and figure out how to just get along. And I think sometimes when I talk about the church being a shield, I think that's one of the things that we need to realize is that our main goal is to be a shield, to be protecting of each other. We need to be the kind of a church. We need to be the kind of a church body of a family where people can feel safe coming. They can feel safe having their own ideas. They can feel safe being different. They can feel safe knowing that they can be themselves and they can come here. But a shield also has that um, property, if I can say it that way, of, of being something where force also allows growth. And that's one of the things that we, uh, we've kind of, as we talked about growth, kind of talked about, um, and we've been kind of using Second, uh, Corinthians chapter 2 as our um, key verses in this study. And uh, just to look over them again, uh, we did this last week, but just looking at them again, it says, So then, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. I think those two words epitomize what the church should really be like. We should be a church that's, first of all, believers that have made those decisions to follow Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. We should be a church that's continuing to look into his word and to see what his word has to say and to dig, to dig deep down into it. But we also need to be the kind of a church that continues to grow and continues to be rooted and to, to grow in that. Um, deep roots Bring a healthy life. You know that. For those of you that are involved in agriculture of any kind, whether it be a backyard gardener like myself or a farmer, you know that. The deeper the roots grow, the better. That's why the the, uh, the psalmist writes and he says in Psalm 1, we just got done reading this, Blessed is the one who does not walk in the step of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners, whose delight is in the law of the Lord. That's scripture. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. A Christian life that is a life that is built on Christ rather is the kind of a life that grows their roots down deep. Now, one of the problems with this plant is the fact that it can't grow much more than it already is. As I showed the kids, and I didn't go into a lot of detail with them, but if you really took a look at this, you'd see that the roots are starting to kind of wind around themselves and it becomes root-bound. Now, do you know, you, know, you guys know what root-bound means. It means that the roots are growing so much around themselves that they're starting to intertwine and, and it, it, um, it hinders the growth. Um, so what we have to do, if you're a gardener, you take something out and you would spill dirt on the pulpit. Uh, you, would, you would take the plant out of the, the planter like this and you would loosen those roots up, right? So that they could get more nutrients. How do you do that? Well, when I'm planting a tree, usually what I do is I take the, the root ball out like this and I'll either take a knife and, and cut down some slots there or take my, my shovel and just kind of tamp it a little bit to kind of loosen everything up so those roots are loose, right? And that's kind of what you do. That way, when you plant it into the ground, it has the ability to branch out, to, to try to go farther out into the ground and get more nutrients from everywhere. And the richer the soil, the better. But let me ask you something. Have you ever thought what the root feels like in that situation? You're taking, for example, a plant out of... I'm really making a mess up here. I'm going to have to get a vacuum cleaner out. I can't make the janitor to do this one. Um, take the roots out. So first of all, if you're a root, you're, t you're in a nice, cozy pot. Life is good. You're getting the moisture you need. You get the, tree, the, uh, the, the nutrients you need. Everything is good. And then all of a sudden, somebody comes along and yanks you out of this thing, first of all. And then they take a knife or a shovel and they start cutting you up to loosen you up. That must be kind of painful if you're a root. And then they stick you where? In a bunch of dirt. Do you know worms poop in dirt? They do. Do you know what else is in dirt? Gophers 
and other parasites and, and, and stuff. And so what you are as a plant, you're all happy as your nice little root-bound area, and now you're being cut up, you're being yanked out of something that gives you all kind of comfort, and you're stuck in a new environment. And what happens? You might think at first that you're going to die because you're in an unfamiliar territory. But what really happens? Your roots start to grow. And they start to branch out. And pretty soon you start to find out that even though it was scary, even though it was, was troublesome, by being able to grow and spread those roots out more, you become healthier. A healthy plant needs healthy roots, and we have that in the Word of God. But we also have that in the body of Christ. Unfortunately, we as humans are kind of like a plant, Sometimes we can become root-bound. And there can be a lot of reasons for that. The first one is fear. Because you've been yanked out of a pot and you've been put in a whole new situation. And it's scary. None of us, I don't think, really enjoy brand new situations or brand new uh, circumstances. But we need to have that. Another reason that uh, we can become root-bound is unforgiveness. Grudges can really cause those roots to, to grow in and to stay tight and we can't get the nutrients that we want. Sometimes, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago so I won't spend a lot of time on it, but sometimes tradition can be like root bounds, bound roots. By, by closing us in and we get so tied up in our own little pot that we don't want to branch out any because we're comfortable here. Have you ever noticed, and you'll notice this in the next couple of weeks if you're planting for spring, how you go into the, the greenhouse, the nursery, and you buy these beautiful plants, and you take them out and you plant them in your garden, and no matter how good you are at gardening, they never look quite the same in your garden as they do in the greenhouse, do they? It doesn't matter how well you do it. Why is that? Because in the greenhouse, in the hothouse, they're in a perfect environment. Guess what? None of us live in a perfect environment. None of us can grow healthy and strong by staying in a hothouse. We need to be branched out. So tradition sometimes keeps us from doing that. And the other reason is sometimes it's hard to really grow because we become rootbound because we're content. We're okay with this. We don't need to branch out. That's a poinsettia. Poinsettias are Christmas plants. It's almost March. Compared to some years, our poinsettia is looking pretty good this year. You know, if we could just... I asked Trisha if I could use this one, by the way, because she said it's time for it to go. But it still looks pretty good. And, you know, sometimes we just kind of get content that way, don't we? We get content with our life. And we become root-bound. The results of that are that we tend to think small. We tend to get ideas that we need to be just comfortable with what we have. We become so uh, absorbed in ourselves that sometimes we get irritated with other people as well. That's not the way the psalmist talks about, though. Look what he says in Psalm 92, verses 12 through 14, or 12 through... Um, yeah, 12 through 15. First of all, Psalm 92, 12 says this. It says, The righteous will flourish like a palm tree. They will grow like a cedar of Lebanon. If you do some research on the cedars of Lebanon, they were beautiful, amazing trees. And they grew healthy and they grew strong because they had the right kind of environment. And the psalmist is saying, when we open our lives up to Christ, when we allow him to really grow in us by being in his word, by being together as family, we grow healthy and we grow strong like the cedar of Lebanon. He goes on to say, they're planted in the house of the Lord and they flourish in the courts of our God. I think what he's saying here is one of the ways that we can grow is this. And we'll talk about it a little bit more later, but the importance of us as a body getting together. We'll look a little later at how the, the early church did that, of the importance of the fact that we need to meet together. Now, this morning I realized there was a little bit of a weather situation out there. But, you know, there's always going to be things that keep us from meeting together. 
And one of the re- ways that we can have healthy soil is by continuing to meet together and, and, and allowing each other to help us through the growth process. The psalmist ends up in verses 14 and says, They will still bear fruit in old age, and they will stay fresh and green, green, proclaiming the Lord is upright, he is my rock, and then there is no wickedness in him. One of the things I see here that talks about root-boundedness is the fact that it says even in their old age they will bear fruit. I'm getting old. Any of you getting old? You know what happens when an old tree, an old apple tree on a farm that's been abandoned, that apple tree is... If it has any apples at all, they're really bad, right? How do you keep an apple tree year after year after year after year to produce good, healthy, firm apples? How do you do that? By taking some sharp object and whacking part of them off by pruning them. Again, think about how the tree feels about that. But sometimes we need to be pruned. And and sometimes... Old isn't always an age. Let me put it that way. Sometimes very young people think very oldly. I'm not sure if oldly is a word. We'll use it today. Sometimes people that are young or old in age think very, very youngly. One example that I can think of right now that's been on my mind the last week was Billy Graham. You know, we just said goodbye to him. Uh, he's in the in the presence of the Lord now. One of the things that I saw on Facebook that I really enjoyed was a quote by him, and I won't say the whole thing because I can't remember it, but it was basically saying, someday you'll hear that Billy Graham is dead. Don't believe a word of it. I'm every bit as much alive now, or I'll be every bit as much alive then as I am now. I've just changed my address, and I'm now living with my Savior One of the things that amazed me about this guy that was 99 years old when he passed away is that he was always young thinking. He he was one of the first people to decide, hey, let's use television to broadcast the word of Jesus. He was one of the first people that said, hey, let's make a movie about Jesus. He, and I think it was back in the, the 80s, I think, that he did a worldwide crusade by satellite. When satellite TV was still in its infancy. He was old, but he was young thinking. So I think sometimes when this says that you know, they will still bear fruit in old age, they're not talk- I don't think the psalmist is talking about years. I, was thinking, I think he's talking about attitude of how we can have an attitude of youngness and an attitude of making the church something that not only reaches out and proceeds out and grows in the area, but also protects those people that are in it. Take a look at this. This might help us understand it a bit. For thousands of years, the church has been a symbol of refuge and hope. Old or new, archaic or modern, this structure has long been home to the ideals of faith, hope, and love. But are these principles confined to live within these walls? Do they exist only among the pews and stained glass windows? Do they reside only in the Bibles and hymnals to be opened at service and then laid to rest until we return again? Could it be that church is more than a building? Could it be a hand reaching out to someone in need? Could it be the embrace of a friend? Or could it be a random act of kindness? That church is more than simply a place. It is home to a calling that goes far deeper. A sanctuary, not built to confine us away from life's trials, but to empower us to share the love of Christ with those around us. It is an opportunity to work together and effectively touch a world in need. It is an opportunity to be more than a building.
is more than a building. You know, and I've said this often. This isn't something that's really pressed. Pastor Mike's bringing a whole new idea into this area. I've said this a million times, that if this building burnt down as we get home today, does Zion die? Not in the, not in the least. Because this isn't Zion. Your Zion. This isn't the church. We are the church. In fact, I like what Bob Merritt said once. He said this. He said, we need to be a strong church. Not a building or not a program, but a strong church. He said, you are the church. You are many parts working together to be strong. That's what we are. Remember the story that Jesus told of the the, uh, sower and the seed? You know, the sower goes through the, the, the field and he throws out seed and some of it falls on hard rocky ground and it doesn't grow at all. Some of it grows on shallow soil and it starts to grow up but then it's taken away. Some of it grows in, in ground where there's all kinds of weeds and thorns and they choke it out. And some of it falls in healthy soil. And he says, the stuff that grows in healthy soil is the stuff that produces a plant that produces fruit and it's It's valuable. What I'd like us to think about today, because usually, in fact, until this last week I did this, we think of that story and we think of the seed. But I want you to think about the soil this morning. What kind of soil are we? What kind of soil are we individually, first of all? Are we the kind of soil that allows the Word of God to work in us and permeate us so much that we're no longer root-bound but we're open to what he says because sometimes he might lead us into some things that are completely opposite of what we've ever thought before. Are we willing to have that healthy soil? And the other part of it is corporately. Not only, well, and actually these go both corporately and individually. So as we have the word of God growing in us corporately or as individuals, we start to grow fruit. We start to branch out. We start to grow our roots outside of the container, outside of the pot to what can we do in the community? What can we do uh, within my own particular circle? Because a root-bound Christian and a root-bound church it's kind of like a root-bound plant. It doesn't grow healthy. It doesn't grow strong. It doesn't produce fruit. And it doesn't matter how old we are, God calls us to produce fruit by being open to his word and being the, the kind of a shield, the kind of a uh, person and group that we're supposed to be. So how can we do that? Well, I want to get, share just three things this morning about what a strong church is. And please, 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 Say it one more time for effect. Please, when I say church, I am not talking about this. I'm talking about that. How can we be a strong church? Three things that I think a strong church needs to do. First of all, a strong church needs to be a safe church. We need to be individually and corporately a place where people can feel safe coming here, not just physically, but emotionally and spiritually and being able to come in and feel comfortable with coming into a new situation because we're like brand new soil to them. We allow them to spread their roots out and to grow and to produce fruit. A strong church is a safe church. Look what Paul says in Ephesians 4. It says, From whom the whole body being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual part causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. That's a safe church. A church in which we work together. We aren't individuals. We aren't, you know, uh, like Paul says in in Corinthians, he talks about, you know, what if the foot says, well, I'm not a hand, so I'm not important. What if the eye says, I'm not an ear, so I'm not important. Now, each one of you is important in the kingdom of God. Each one of you is like this plant that needs to branch out and get outside of the walls of whatever container we happen to be living in, whether it be fear or whether it be guilt or whether it be uh, tradition or whatever that pot is, and to be able to reach out and grow outside of that into new soil to allow the Word of God to work new things in our lives so we produce fruit not only individually, but corporately, I want to ask for a raise of hands on this. 
How many of you have ever had the opportunity to kneel beside someone and ask them and pray with them to accept Jesus Christ as their personal Savior? It is amazing. Because you're you're sitting there, kneeling there, whatever you happen to be doing, and you're praying with that person, and you realize that as they say that prayer, you are changing their eternity. You're changing their destiny. And because of your input in their lives, they will now spend eternity in heaven because you took the time to branch out into new soil and to bear fruit. It's amazing. A safe church is a church that reaches out and becomes a body that works together. We all know, and some of us that are older and old in age know better than others, what happens when the body kind of starts, stops working as well as you used to think it is. This, this left knee has been driving me nuts for about the last three months. It's just like, ugh. You know, it's not working very well. What happens when the church doesn't work very well? Can we produce fruit? Can we do the things that God calls us to do? A safe church a strong church is a safe church. Secondly, a strong church is also a seeking church. Now, I want to explain what I mean by that because a quote-unquote seeker church is sometimes um, there, there's a group out there called a seeking church. And uh, what we tend to have within quote-unquote seeker churches is that they're more about entertainment value than they are about theology value. When I say we're a seeking church, I do not mean that we need to be a church that entertains people, but that we need to be a church that is seeking how we can be fruit, how we can be new soil, how we can welcome new seed into our soil so they can in turn grow and they can be, produce fruit and they can make our soil strong. How can we do that? Well, Psalm, Acts chapter ver, chapter 2 talks about it in uh, verses 46 through 47. And I kind of split these up so we could kind of... Uh, I'm not following verses. I'm following phrases to maybe help us understand it a little bit better. The first part of that says, Every day they continue to meet together in the temple courts. This is talking about the new Christians. This is talking about the people that very shortly after the Holy Spirit came and, and, and filled them, they were filled with the Holy Spirit, they were meeting together, and it says every day they continue to meet together in the temple courts. Now if you see that, you might not think much of it, except there's a couple of very interesting things about that statement. First of all, they were Christians meeting in a Jewish meeting place. What group of people would be more understanding of the whole Christian thing than the Jews? So they were meeting together in an area where people would be interested in what they were talking about. They were branching out. It would be like us going and meeting... I don't know, I can't even think of an example of that. Meeting elsewhere, though, to be where people are. They weren't where the people were. The second thing is that they did is they met together, corporately, for study, for, for prayer, to get together, to, to lift each other up. They were a seeking church. They put themselves in situations where other people would see them. The second thing is, it says, they broke bread together in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. This part talks about fellowship. It talks about the early church was a seeking church because they just got together. It's difficult. I'll I'll share with you, it's difficult with me as a pastor Sometimes because, and, and some of you know this because I've shared it with you, I have such a passion, such a desire to see luck really grow spiritually. Cumberland too and Frederick, but I don't know, for some reason luck. And I, I, I see a real need to do that and I can't do it alone, which is good because then I get proud and that's a whole other issue. But we can and, and a lot of people, whether you like it or not, whether you agree with it or not, whether your root-boundedness doesn't allow you to see it or not, there's a lot of people that will not come to church. They won't come to church because the churches that they've been to in the past haven't been safe. 
They've been churches built on tradition. They've been churches that have been judgmental about how they dress or how they believe or how they want to sing or all of those things. And they haven't been able to feel safe. And so they're not going to come here to feel safe unless we can first show them that, hey, you're safe. And so what was happening in the early church is they were getting together for church at the temple. And then they were also getting together during the week at their homes, breaking bread and enjoying the favor of all the people, which implies, from my understanding, that it wasn't just Christians getting together to eat. You know, it's amazing. God really knows the importance of food. If you think about the number of times that God uses food in the Bible to attract people, and it's still working today. If you invite somebody over for Bible study and prayer, if you get anybody, you're doing really well, because most of the time you won't get that. Try inviting them over for a barbecue. Be different? There's food involved, of course. So what would happen if you invited them over for a barbecue and said, hey, you know what? I'm thinking of doing a book study. We're doing a book of the Bible. Do you want to come and join us? That just might work. But if you invite them over and say, hey, will you come to church with me? Well, no, they're not sure about that. Not until we can kind of get in there. So, And that's what the, the early church was doing is that they, they, were, they were spending time together in fellowship, but then they were also inviting and reaching out, getting outside of their flower pot to reach out to other people and to draw them in. And you know what happened after that? It finishes up in the last part of this passage. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being served, saved. At one point, over 5,000 people on a single day that accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior because of the church. But notice who did the work. The people met together corporately. The people met together to eat and to have fellowship. And the Lord, the Lord is the one that added to them. That's another thing. I guess I'm doing a lot of, you know, struggles with Pastor Mike sharing this morning, but that's another thing that I have to constantly remind myself of, is no matter how much I pray over this lesson and how much I, I try to implement things here to get this church to, to, to reach out and to grow and things like that, it ain't about me. And it's not about you. It's about what the Lord wants. And yeah, I'll admit to you, it's easy for me to get rootbound. It's easy for me to get so tied up in what I think should happen to this plant that I don't always look at all the fresh soil around me. And that's what the early church did because a strong church is a seeking church, but a strong church is also a strategic church. Take a look at what uh, Romans 12 says, Romans 12, 13. It says, Contribute to the needs of the saints and practice hospitality. <clears throat> now, if you look at that, you might not see, uh, you know, exactly because a lot of times the Bible, uh, it'll say something and in the original languages it, it gives us a little deeper meaning. What Paul is really writing here about is we need to do two things. We need to take care of our own needs as individuals, but we also need to practice hospitality, which kind of goes along with the idea of what I just got done talking about, about reaching out, about being fresh soil, about reaching out within our own circles to bring people into the faith, however that means, whether it be on our own or whether it means through the church program. But what I want you to focus on here is one little word there. It says practice hospitality. Now, I used to coach basketball. One of the most important things that I learned in my coaching career, which wasn't extremely long, was the importance of practice. If we didn't practice, we didn't play well. The other thing I learned about practice is that it was important to plan practices specifically and strategically. I coach middle school girls, I coach middle school boys, and again, I'm not picking on middle school age when I say this, but you got to have a plan. If you don't have a plan, you're going to have complete chaos. And I think what a strong church is is, is a strong church that, pract- that that is strategic. And what I mean by strategic is we look at and we plan, and our council is working on things like this, of looking at and planning how can we best meet the needs of this community. 
Not only our spiritual community here, but the community of Frederick and Luck in Cumberland. Not just looking at day-to-day operations, but what, what do we need to be doing now to make this place more uh, better soil in the next five years or three years or even two years? What do we need to do to plan? Uh, many of you are involved in business of one sort or another, whether it was agriculture or whether it's any other kind of business. You know the importance of planning ahead. The early church knew the importance of practicing hospitality, of doing things that would be important. Uh, John Piper says this, he says, Your hospitality is an extension of God's grace. To be a good steward means to practice hospitality in the lives of others. He goes on to say, Christian unity includes affectionate love, not just sacrifice for those you don't like. I kind of like that one. Christian unity includes affectionate love, not just sacrifice for those you don't like. What I think he's saying there anyway is this. It's easy to say I love you because God told me I have to love you because you're a brother in Christ. It's entirely different to have a totally affectionate attitude towards you, spiritually speaking, because you are a brother or a sister in Christ. So let me ask you this morning, as we close our time together and as we get ready for the praise team, what's your root system like this morning? What's your root system like? Are you content to stay where you're at, either physically or spiritually? Have you become root-bound? This plant may not make it through the service. We're almost done. Or are you willing to step outside of the flower pot and move into fertile soil and watch what God can do for you? What's your root system like? My prayer for us, and when I say us, believe me, I mean us because I have to work on some things. My prayer for us is that we will be a church, a body of Christ, a body, a group of believers that will be willing to step outside of the flower pots of our lives into the fresh soil that God has for us so that we can grow like the cedar of Lebanon, like the tree planted beside still waters, so that even during the drought season, even during those times when life gets tough, we will have the nutrients and the ability to grow strong and healthy. That's my prayer for us individually, That's my prayer for for us as a body. Would you stand together as we close? Father, I thank you for this morning, and I just, uh, I pray for us. I pray for for each of my brothers and sisters in Christ here that are gathered together this morning. I, I pray, Father, that if there's any of us that are really struggling with bound roots, that you'll help us to step out and to endure the pain, to endure the risk, to endure the struggle, to be planted in new soil. I pray that you would help us if we're struggling with the fear that goes along with that or tradition or any of the other things that might keep us from really sensing your presence, to be able to set all of that aside so that we can grow strong and healthy in you. Because, Lord, I know from what your word has said, that you want each of us to be a healthy plant so that we as a fellowship of believers can also be a healthy plant. Would you please help us to do that and to examine our hearts and our minds in that regard. And I pray these things in your name. Amen.